here on behalf of Margaret, and um, she'll be back next week. But and being joined obviously by our awesome co-hosts Stacy and Jess from Connectable Life, and very excited to have our fantastic guest speaker Catherine Main, who's going to be talking finance today, and she's going to be letting us know how on earth we are gonna be able to keep up with the cost of living because everything seems to have gone haywire with the price of petrol, et cetera. But she's also gonna to touch on a subject that I think is just so important. I've just come back from Australia where I was with my grandkids and they really seem to be very money savvy there. And it's just how to keep your children money savvy because I think that is so important too, is to make sure that your kids know that money doesn't actually grow on trees, guys. Um, you know, you've got to find ways of letting them know how to keep their money safe when they eventually get their own bank accounts, etc. But I'd like to hand over now to Jess um, to tell you a bit more about Connectable Life. And then Jess, yeah, and then we'll take it from there. Thanks so much. Amazing. Thanks, Glenda. It's so lovely to uh, share this platform with you again. And again to Catherine, thank you so much for joining us. Um, those of you that don't know Catherine, um, Catherine believes in the promise of the future, but knows how difficult it can be to secure a future worth fighting for. While she maintains an ever optimistic outlook on the future, she is a realist through and through when it comes to taking the right steps today to make tomorrow worthwhile. Hard work, dedication, the ability to embrace uncertainty, and a massive drive for success are what have put this entrepreneur maverick in the spot, spotlight time and time again and made money savvy such a success. Having started her first business at the age of 22, Catherine has grown from strength to strength across marketing, advertising, project management and business management to get to where she is today, one of South Africa's most sought after female entrepreneurs. She believes in paying it forward bringing everyone along for the journey and as a voice of confidence and encouragement when it comes to female empowerment and opportunity for all. Coming to the idea of money savvy kids happened organically for Catherine when she looked at her three sons and realized just how underprepared they were when it came to financial, financial literacy. Their schools were doing nothing to address this, so she decided to take the bull by the horns and be the change she wanted to see in the world. Catherine has won uh, in the last five years um, eight accolades, two of which are actually Margaret Hirsch um, awards, which is really fantastic. And uh, somehow she has also found the time to author the raising uh, to uh, author a book, Raising Money Savvy Kids, in between delivering keynote speeches, fetching and carrying uh, her kids to and from school, homeschooling, and maintaining a healthy relationship with her stakeholders licensees and uh, mentees uh, across South Africa. So Catherine, it really is such an honor to have you with us this morning. <clears throat> there was ever a time where we needed a voice of reason when it came to finances. I think now is certainly the time. I think everybody is feeling the pinch, um, especially post COVID times. And uh, we would love to hear what we can do to <clears throat> alleviate this stress that comes with finances. Thanks so much for the introduction, Glenda. Thanks for having me today. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm so passionate about money. You know, I, I have been broke. Um, good morning, Rahana. I have been broke and I've been bankrupt um, after having children. So I know exactly what it feels like to have nothing as an adult while you're trying to look after your children. And financially educating myself really did change my life. If we just look at what's happened in the last two years and the culmination now of the pinch that we're feeling isn't so much all of a sudden because the petrol price has gone up. It's been a gradual progression over the last two years. We first we in, we first um, we went through our first global epidemic, which we've never experienced before. You know, a lot of us weren't prepared for that. So one of the things we never taught, which is what we really need to start um, discussing with our children, is being able to identify the potential financial threats and opportunities that could come our way in life. So life is like a game of snakes and ladders. You know, you never know what the next roll of the dice is going to give you. You could roll the dice on your way to work and have a car accident. 
um, and be paralyzed, or you could get a promotion. So depending on whether you, what, how your life plays out, you could have good things happen or bad things happen, but we never really show how it's going to play out. So if you have to think about yourself and where you are in your life stage, and we all have, we all have different life stages, we all have different incomes, we all have different values. If you had to forecast ahead for the next 20 years of your life, what are some of the financial threats that you think are going to come your way? So let's talk about some of the financial threats. So we've just had our first global epidemic, okay? Um, who, who had planned for that? I know I hadn't planned for it because I didn't know it was coming, but people who had savings in the bank and who had medical aid um, if they needed to go to hospital and who had income protectors if they lost their job, those guys were, were probably okay and it didn't destroy their financial life. But there's a lot of people that don't have savings and don't have access to medical aid and don't have access to insurance. So, you know, we need to start thinking about how can we plan ahead just in case the next global epidemic hits? Because the chances that it's happened is probably likely that it's going to happen again. We already have the threat of monkeypox in our country. The cases that we have are completely um, unrelated and those people have never traveled before. So it's already here. How it spreads and what happens is going to um, <clears throat> determine whether we go into another lockdown or not. So all you can do now is start to plan ahead. So other than these big global threats that are coming our way, we also are busy lifing every day. So think about the financial threats that could come your way. So um, are you married? Could you possibly be getting divorced? That's a financial threat. I know my divorce set me back almost four years financially. Um, what about having children? That's also a financial threat. What about starting a business um, now during COVID and all of a sudden it doesn't do well? That's a financial threat. So what are the threats, if you have to make a list, what are some of the threats that you think could come your way in the next 20 years? And what are some of the things that you can do to protect yourself from those threats? Okay, so having savings in the bank is going to help protect you from a lot of things. If you have um, a year's worth of salary saved up in your bank account, it doesn't matter whether you get sick or there's a global epidemic or your partner passes away, um, you know that you've got enough money to survive for a year. Okay, so savings is always a really good way to mitigate any risk, financial risk in your life. Secondly, looking at insurance and making sure that you have the right kind of insurance for you. So I see a lot, um, we do a lot of training across the country um, at dif different levels. And I see that people have insurance, but a lot of them have the wrong insurance. So people who have kids will rather have a medical aid than have life insurance with dread disease cover and disability. You know, if you're in a car accident um, and you have medical aid, great, you'll go to a nice hospital and you'll recover for three or four months. But if you are disabled from that accident and you didn't have disability cover, how are you going to make money going forward? You know, so you need to be able to also look at the life stage that you're in and make sure that you're getting the insurance that's going to protect the most important thing in your life, which is yourself, because essentially you are the most important asset. Because without you as the parent or the adult, you know, nothing else is really going to happen. So really understanding what are the potential financial threats and, and planning ahead for them. But life is not all bad and often we get given opportunities. So maybe people did start um, businesses in COVID and actually did really well. Um, another opportunity would be um, taking a loan to go and do tertiary education. But very quickly, our opportunities can also turn into threats if we're not managing them properly. Okay, so think about people who win the lotto or people who inherit money. How often do they actually manage to keep that money or that inheritance? They land up spending it very quickly because they, there's no thought around, okay, well, I need to make this money last for 10 years. It's just like, oh, I've got all this money. I'm going to spend it. Okay, so even when there are opportunities happening, you still need to have a plan and plan for those opportunities. So if you're going to take out a student loan to do tertiary education, as an example, if you don't pay that loan back, you're going to start your adult life blacklisted. So when you're looking at the opportunities, also look at how to make sure they don't become financial threats for you. So that's the starting point, is looking at what are the potential threat, threats and um, that you can plan for. The second biggest thing that every single person should be doing right now is um, relooking their budgets. So it's now, what, July? It's just gone July. We've had eight petrol price increases. We've had three interest rate hikes. 
Food's gone up. I don't know if you guys have bought oil recently, but I almost had heart failure when I bought a two liter oil. It was a hundred rand. I couldn't believe it. Um, and just everything just keeps going up. So how are you as a salaried employee surviving on a fixed income when the cost of living keeps rising? How can you make sure that you don't very quickly get into debt? Because if you don't have that year's worth of savings in the bank, most of us are less than three months away from bankruptcy. Okay, think about yourself as an example. If you didn't get paid your salary for three months and you couldn't pay your car and your house and your school fees, after that three months, the bank would start trying to take your car and your house, your kids would be kicked out of school. How much money have you got saved to, to cater for those, for those times? So you really need to look at budgeting. And when I say you need to look at budgeting, I want you to really start to interrogate what it is that you're spending and how you are spending your money. So a lot of people that I work with don't look at their bank statements. Stacey, Jess, do you guys interrogate your bank statements every month? No, not well enough. Definitely not. <laughs> my husband does. <laughs> yes, so does my husband. <laughs> So you'll, you'll be surprised actually how much money you realize that you waste when you actually start to interrogate what you're spending. So I got to a point where after my divorce, I had scaled back, I cut 50% of my income, uh, of my expenses. But a year later, I actually was in 150,000 rand debt in a year, in 12 months, it took me to get there because I realized that uh, what I was doing was I was spending more than I earned every single month. And when I went back and interrogated all of my spending, I had five different bank accounts and was spending 3,000 Rand on bank charges. I was probably spending about 5,000 Rand a month on stuff that I couldn't account for. Lunches with friends that popping into the shop to buy stuff at the garage. Um, and I, I really had to make some big lifestyle changes and shifts to cut back. And when, we, when we're relooking our budgets, it's not like, okay, well, um, I can cut back on these things. I can relook my insurance. A lot of it's a mindset shift. So for me, during lockdown, um, I didn't, money savvy didn't earn money for five months, you know, which was the bulk of my income. So the first thing I did was I cut my expenses by another four or 5,000 rand a month. And one of the things that got cut was our food budget. And I have three teenage boys. So I literally had to work out how much I could afford to spend. And I planned every single meal to the detail of what I was going to do. Um, but that was now I had to change how I planned. I had to change how I shopped and I had to change how I cooked. So, you know, when you're relooking your budget and you have to be ruthless, don't just think about how you can change it financially. What are some of the things that you're going to have to do as an individual to change your financial situation? Because it's great that you have the theory behind it, but if you're not implicating the actual change, nothing is going to change. So the first thing that you need to be 100% clear on is where are you exactly? Like how much debt do you have? What is your credit score looking like? Um, how much money are you short every month? Like how much money could you possibly save every month? So if you had to go um, and relook all of your service providers, your Wi-Fi, your insurance, your bank accounts, um, the entertainment that you have, Netflix versus Showmax versus Flixtor, whatever all of those things are, if you just went and interrogated some of those expenses and started shopping around, you could probably cut your expenses by a thousand, two thousand rand immediately. That was just from like the small things. And if you actually go through your bank statements and start to interrogate how much cash are you drawing every month and what are you doing with that cash? How often when you have money in your wallet, do you just spend it without even thinking? So for me, I've got kids. I'm like this. It's just it goes. Um, and how much money are you wasting every month? Because when you understand how much money you're wasting, there's so much more money that you could be saving. So when you stop spending money on things that you don't need, you can start to prioritize things that are important, like planning for situations like a global epidemic, as an example. Does anybody have any questions or any inputs? I feel like I'm just talking. <laughs> yeah, I love, I love what you're talking like of like interrogating your 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 bank statement and almost doing like a stock take on yourself and your life we actually just went through this because the last couple of months we were like why do we keep we have got a budget but we found ourselves constantly going over the budget and we sat and we looked at it all and it was it was we were spending three times the amount on petrol than we normally do and i know that's not really within our control because 
you know, we've all spoken about the, the cost of petrol, that we did have to relook at things because suddenly that area of our budget um, had increased had changed. So, mm. so dramatically. But, you know, you don't know what you don't know. So if we don't look at these things and um, then we can't change these things and then we will constantly be uh, going further and further into the red. Yeah. I'd also like to just say something, Catherine, Stace and Jess, I hear you that, you know, with, with regards to your husbands being the people that are in charge of the bank account, but I honestly think that women need to really be, it, it needs to be a partnership. I, I'm a Definitely. widow. I never really bothered. I never bothered with bank statements when I was married. And when my husband died, I, I was literally thrown into it. And I, you know, I, it was a little bit daunting to start with, but I have now become so aware of how important it is to take control of your finances um, right from the start. So I'm just telling everybody out there who is married, who thinks that husbands should be taking care of finances, mm -hmm. absolute nonsense. You guys need to step up to the plate as well. And I know so, that Margaret agrees here. She's, she's very much... Uh, um, women should be in charge of the purse strings. So, yeah, girls. And too. also, in reality, in reality, the chances that you're going to stay married to the person that you married in your 20s these days is pretty slim. And if you're in a relationship and you allow all the financial power to sit with one person, if that's the person that cheated, you don't have any idea what's going on with the cash and the money. So, you know, I, I'm, I'm also a firm believer that women should definitely manage their finances. And if you are working as a team, and I, I believe marriage is always about teamwork, there should be clear oversight for, for everybody involved. Yeah, I agree. I'm just, I'm not good with money. I shouldn't say I'm not good with money. It's just, it just takes up too much space in my head at the moment, just trying to negotiate every other ball. So yeah. I do leave it up to him. But if I did have to take that on, I feel like I would be fairly capable of doing it. Just because like with you, there is so much research, like so much out there that you can just jump on and get advice and find a coach and get help somewhere, you know. Um, sometimes it's a little bit late and then you have to scramble and have to play catch up. But at least we are living in a world where we can get the help we need when we need it, you know. That's well, I think that pro the problem with the problem with money and, and help is that firstly, money carries a lot of shame. So when people are in financial trouble, they generally don't tell other people because they have a shame factor around it. So when you look at how money has been glorified on social media by people like the Kardashians, as an example, you know, like aspiring to live this glamorous lifestyle. Um, so many of our young people are looking at this lifestyle saying, this is what I want. And it's not real and it's not attainable for most people. Um, but we're not taught to start thinking logically. So like I have three teenage boys and my oldest son is turning 20 this year and he still doesn't know what he wants to do in terms of like life, you know, what he wants to study and all of those things. And we're playing around with courses and whatever. And I said to him, okay, so forget about career. Like what kind of life do you want to live? Like what kind of lifestyle do you see for yourself? Do you want to get married? Uh, do you see yourself having children? He's like, no, I definitely don't want kids. I was like, okay, well, that's going to save you a lot of money in your life. Uh, what kind of car do you want to drive? Like, what kind of house do you want to live in? Like, what does your life look like in your mind? So from his little um, um, idea, his dream life, we kind of worked it backwards. And I said, okay, by the time you're 25, you need to be clearing a minimum of 25,000 rand a month to get to this level at this age. So, you know, also teaching teenagers to be clear about the kind of life that they want to live. So if your child is artistic, you know, the chances that they're going to be this amazing artist is, is, is going to be really rare. Um, <coughs> and be, sorry, totally well recognized. But, you know, there's so many other things that they can do with art to make money these days. So really just having the honest conversation about what kind of life do you want? Because if you want to be an artist and live on an artist salary and you don't want to have kids, then it's an achievable goal for you. Yeah. And I just then, also wanted to touch, sorry, Catherine, yes. touch back on Genda's point of, um, you know, having equal sort of uh, 
parts to play in the financial household. I fully agree with that because I think also, you know, sometimes with financial power comes financial pressure and you don't want to put all that uh, stress and pressure of finances on one person. Um, but I also think it's okay for us to sort of have our roles in the relationship. So as long as the discussion is had between both of you in terms of where the money's coming from, where it's going to, what the budget looks like, what we should be spend spending, what we shouldn't be spending. Um, but then, you know, in terms of like the, the physical role, um, that's where, where my husband steps in. But I do agree that it needs to be shared in terms of responsibility. Otherwise, it can be extremely um, stressful having to deal with it all. And actually, it should be it should be a family discussion, you know. Mm -hmm. So Glenda was saying earlier, like we're not talking to our kids and teens about money. So money is this taboo conversation. Um, so a lot of men don't like to talk about money, actually. Um, and men run households; they don't ask questions. Children don't ask questions. So when you guys are reworking your budgets to make sure you're catering for the extra petrol, get the kids involved. So what I did with my kids was um, when we had to like really cut down on the food budget, I said to them, okay, guys, this is what I need to buy. And this is the price that I've allocated to every single item. If you can find stuff cheaper, whatever money is left, you can spend on whatever you want. So the boys would split the list and go and try and find something cheaper than what I'd allocated on the list. And they always had 80, 150 rand for them to buy whatever they wanted. And it became kind of like a challenge. And then I got them involved in the whole cooking side of things as well, you know, to teach them the responsibility around the whole planning thing. So when you are budgeting, get the kids involved, because if you start having money conversations with them early, they're going to be confident to have these conversations when they're older. 100%. And can I just add in there, and I think Stace, you know, being a, a farmer's wife, you'll agree with this. I think everybody should actually be growing their own vegetables now. Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> Because mm -hmm. you can grow organic, you know, and that's what we yes. should all be doing. I've got, so I've got a garden full of, yeah, I've got a garden full of rocket. I'm, I'm the rocket girl, really, because, <laughs> yeah, that's me. <laughs> so, but the vegetable um, garden isn't just going to feed you. It could also create a second income for yourself. Exactly. I have been selling my rocket, yeah. Yeah. But, so, um, so that's that's another really important point for, uh, for discussion at the moment is um, if you have a job, uh, and you need to make more money because everything is going up. Like, what are your options? How do you, how do you actually make, how do you start a side hustle? You know, like, how do you do it? And what do you do? So there's so many ways to make money. So firstly, we have the power of digital. So with digital, you can make one product and sell it multiple times. So, you know, there's platforms like Udemy where people are selling courses with the LMS systems that are available. You can even get a free LMS and build a course. You know, you build one course and you sell it a thousand times at a hundred rand. You've made your money back in time and everything, and you've created a passive income stream for yourself. So how can you create something digitally? You know, we're not, we're not empty vessels. We all have some kind of magic inside of us. Some of us can write, some of us can cook, some of us can make things, you know, some of us are like excellent strategists. We all have a skill. Okay, whether that skill is handmade or, or more technical, you can make a course out of it. Whether you're teaching people how to knit or whether you're teaching them how to do Excel formulas, you can create a course. All you need to do is identify who you can sell the product to and what the sweet spot is. Okay, with digital as well, there's um, all these affiliate programs. So you can become a new skin agent or sell um, Amazon products or resell products like Lead Squared or HubSpot if you're in the marketing industries. Okay, so which is also then passive income. You can also look at um, writing ebooks and selling them. You can try and be a TikTok influencer. Uh, you can sell things online. Um, you know, I taught my son, we built him a, a drop shipping website and he started selling hoodies when he was in um, standard eight, grade 10. Sorry, I still work in standards, showing my age here um, in grade 10. And it didn't cost any money. It was really just time. And he didn't even have to invest in the products because we did a drop shipping model. So, you know, really looking at how can you leverage digitally, because most people have internet and a, a really good phone these days. Another option is how do you turn your passion into profit? So I'm a vegan, my partner's a vegan, and so I cook separately for the kids. So, and I love to cook and I've turned my cooking, my vegan cooking passion into a business. So instead of 
I don't have the time to run another business. So I've empowered my domestic and my partner's domestic and I've taught them all the recipes and we're now renovating a house for a kitchen. And I've now taken our domestic workers and I've made them but my business partners and they're going to be running a kitchen in, in a couple of months time. So, you know, I took my passion for making vegan food. I just started cooking and freezing it and everyone was like, oh my gosh, it's amazing, amazing. So we were like, okay, cool, let's run a pilot. Let's take 10 meals and see if we can sell them. And we came up with a new business idea. So how can you turn your passion into profit? If you're that person that loves to make muffins or you make the best fed cook in town, how can you sell them? Um, so we work with a lot of small businesses. Um, I'm an entrepreneurial coach as well, and I do quite a lot of training across the country. And we work in a lot of um, outlying areas in like Clarksdorp and Clan William in the Western Cape, where the access to money is so much smaller and they don't have digital. These guys we teach to grow vegetable gardens. Like um, I have this lady, Beauty, who um, had 2,000 rand saves and she bought 40 handbags and she sold 36 of the handbags in two weeks for 8,000 rand and made her money back and made a 6,000 rand profit. Um, I had another lady who made mint, mince fit cook and she's making an extra 5,000 rand a month just selling them on a Saturday in the main street in Clan William. So, you know, there's many ways that people can make money and it doesn't matter how much money you have with a really small investment, you can start to bootstrap your way through to do something. So the whole point of this part of the conversation was, how can you create a second income stream for yourself? And ideally, how can you create a passive income stream for yourself? So how much of it can you automate? How much can you get other people to do for you so that you physically not having to do the most, the bulk of the work yourself? I think that's very cool. absolutely and, and brilliant. That, yeah. Yeah. And it's something that became um, quite normal in, you know, as you said, sometimes we can find opportunity in the sort of hard times. And I think in COVID people were, well, during COVID people were forced to do these things, bake the muffins, grow the vegetables. Um, and, and I think a lot of people through losing jobs decided, okay, now's the time to actually, um, make my passion work for me and do things that scared them before because, um, you know, the, the stable salary is, uh, it feels way more secure than going out there and doing what you actually love. Um, and then yeah. there was kind of nothing to lose and people started doing exactly that. Yeah. And we've seen Absolutely. a huge thing. So COVID for me made my business go like this because all of a sudden people were losing jobs. They needed business coaching. They needed marketing services and they needed financial help. So COVID for my business was, I increased by 300%. Sure. sure. Amazing. That's fantastic. Uh, and, and it was so interesting last week, Hirsch has had an um, in-store function. Finally, we're back in stores, which is fantastic. And uh, Margaret went around, there were about 120 people at the Waterfall branch and asked them what they had been doing during COVID. And just about all of them had had to give up their jobs um, they'd been retrenched and they'd started they'd started uh, their own business they'd you know become entrepreneurs so and I think that's that's the way of South Africa we should be leading the way in entrepreneurship this country this country should we should have that I think and I think Catherine you know you you're the perfect person to be in the front run there with people like Margaret so yeah entrepreneur entrepreneurship is the way to go well, and, I've and maybe a, yeah, I've also developed a license model. So I've taken my business idea, Money Savvy, and I've created franchises. And I sell them for 8,000 Rand, you know, and I make the licensee pay me 1,000 Rand a month for eight, eight, uh, for eight months. And I teach them how to sell, how to train, how to market. You know, everything already exists. The server exists, the product exists, the branding exists, you know, so you don't have to know how to do sales and marketing and have this big infrastructure. Um, and we're now scaling into Africa as well. We actually have a, our first country franchise opening soon. I'm not going to spill the beans yet because the contract's not signed. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, if more people who have uh, access to this kind of knowledge can just do what I'm doing, you know, creating more opportunities for other people. Also, a connectable life. You know, they've got a platform where you as a coach can come on and they'll market your services for you. So how can we, how can we build these networks as women? How can we empower each other? through these networks. 
And it's so important to start it in those school years because, I mean, when you, it's not really given to you as an option. You kind of sold the idea of go to school, matriculate, go to university, um, finish there, find a job. You're not really sold this, this idea of, hey, you know, you can actually start your own business. You don't even have to go to university if you don't want to. So if, if teens are um, given the inspiration to do this and then obviously showing the tools on how to do it, then um, it, yeah, it's, it's such an amazing space for them. Yeah. If we also look at like our, our, our values and our money mindset around money. So um, Glenda said something earlier where she said, uh, we have to teach our children that money doesn't grow on trees. And, you know, that was something that my mom drummed into my head. Money doesn't grow on trees. But actually what she did was she made me believe that money was hard to come by by telling me that because the negativity in that statement created such a perception for me that money was going to be hard to come by and it wasn't going to be easily accessible in my life. So when we have a look at what we say about money, the statements that we say, how we think and we feel about money, you have to interrogate how much of that is actually yours. So... Um, think about yourself. So you guys have kids. So you and your husband came from two different backgrounds. You each had your own money blueprint. Maybe one of you was a saver and one of you was a spender as an example. So now you have these two very different financial blueprints coming in to raise a bunch of kids. Okay, so my ex-husband and I, we didn't have the same values. We didn't value the same things with regards to money or family, okay? Um, and it became such a problem when we started to have money conversations because we hadn't created our family values and we hadn't created a value that we wanted to teach our children that we both believed in um, because the values that we had were not our own at the time. So think about what your parents say to you, the statements that you have. Think about your beliefs around money. How many of them are actually yours and not given to you from when you were younger, from your parents, from your churches, from your schools? A lot of how we think and feel about money and our mindset around money is given to us by the people around us. So one of the first things we do when we teach financial literacy, one of the lessons that we do is actually around values. Because when you understand what you value as an individual, it's much easier to prioritize spending your money in a specific way. So as an example, my core, my core value is freedom. And freedom means a lot of things for me, you know, freedom to work for myself, to be a stay-at-home stay mom with my kids, not that I'm a stay-at-home mom, but uh, the freedom to retire at 52, which is my plan, the freedom to work my own hours and sign my own paycheck, and the freedom to do whatever I want, okay? So, but freedom for me means retiring at 52, which means that I have to save a lot of my income, okay? And that takes a lot of discipline. And every time I want to buy something and I'm like, ooh, oof, that's not going to go into my savings this month, I have to ask myself, do you really need this? And is it going to help you live your value and live your dream of retiring at 52? And generally I can walk away and say, you know what, I really don't need this thing that much because it's not what I value. I value when my children are grown up because I've been working since I was 15. I want to go and travel the world and enjoy my life. That's my dream. So, you know, understanding what we value and why we spend the money the way that we do is very important. So if retiring comfortably is a value for you, you want to make sure that you start saving from your first paycheck. If your relationship with God is the most important thing to you, you're going to um, tie the church and you're going to get very involved in donations in that level. Um, if family is an important value to you, you're going to prioritize things like having life insurance and medical aid cover and, and uh, schooling policies for your children. So as an individual, understand what is, what is your money mindset and what do you value? And make sure you're prioritizing when you're working on your budget, spending money on the things that are important to you. Yeah, I love that. And <laughs> I want to find out from you girls that have got kids at school, obviously all three of you, ha have they got entrepreneurial programs at the schools? I'm just thinking back to when my kids were at school and I tried to introduce one, funnily enough, at Hilton where my boys were. And um, I even bought my one son a fridge because he wanted to sell ice creams. And I got shouted at for doing that, but he carried on. I mean, it was one of those schools where, you know, you could sort of ease your way in. So um, he became like an ice cream salesman. Today he's doing incredibly well in business, I have to say. But, you know, I think it's just so important that schools adopt some sort of entrepreneurial program. Do they have them at the schools that your kids are at? So generally those programs are like my money savvy program. They're bought in by the school as an add-on. 
So the entrepreneurial training is very limited in, in terms of the textbooks and the stuff that they're learning, even at a high school level, like they're still teaching kids about checkbooks. Like actually in the grade 10 EMS curriculum, they are teaching kids about checkbooks. When was the last time you even saw a checkbook lender? You know, I'm just like, so the, the curriculum isn't geared and the kind of entrepreneurial days that they are doing aren't geared. But then also, how can you have a teacher who's never run a business teach kids how to run a business? Hmm. That's why these programs yeah, are being absolutely. brought into the schools because the teachers and don't have the skills. Yeah, and I, I also think yeah. that it's because, um, you know, they should bring them in much younger. You know, it shouldn't be a high school thing. I know some of the uh, lit subjects have got money savvy uh, concepts, but it, it needs to be younger than that. It needs to be like grade three level that they start coming in with financial literacy. And none of my, my kids are all at different schools and it doesn't seem like any of them teach financial literacy. So it would be a good place for every school to start introducing it. Well, all you guys have to do is speak to the principal and say, listen, we know this Money Savvy program. Please can I give your yes. number to, to the Money Savvy team and one of my licensees will contact them because we have a footprint in Northwest, Limpopo, KZN, Western Cape and Joburg at the moment where we have licensees and soon um, um, one country, one Southern African country as well. So we also happy if you guys want to get us in touch with the schools, we'll do the hard work and do the selling. I can see that working. It would probably be an extracurricular. It would be like, yeah. do you want to join the club? Is a money savvy club, and I think every parent would put. But it really should be part of that. life orientation. Sure. It should be part of the you know. There's the a life really really program. small a small section in um, life orient orientation that covers like the different sort of avenues that you can go into. Um, but there's no skills taught. There's no value given. It's kind of these are the things you can do. Go figure out what you want to do, kind of thing. Um, but again, like Catherine says, if you haven't run a business yourself, it's really, really hard to teach someone how to to run a business because you have no clue what what goes into it. But Catherine, yeah. just to ask you, so um, obviously the program can be run in schools, but obviously parents can do it in their homes with their kids themselves as well. And so, if so, how would they go about it? So if you wanted to, you could go onto my website, moneysavvyhumans.co.za, and you can download my book for free, How to Raise Money Savvy Kids. And in there, there's little par uh, chapters on, okay, well, if your kid's this age, this is what you should be doing and talking to them about. Uh, but we also have a program called Moms with Money and Dads with Dough, and that's really a, a, like a family workshop where we work with the kids, um, where we teach the parents how to teach the kids how to manage their money and give the parents and the kids skills that they didn't have. Um, and then we also have a couples and currency uh, program where I work actually with Paula Quincy. She's a, a relationship expert, and we actually teach couples how to have those money talks and to create your, your money values. Um, <clears throat> so you can, if you have the skills, you can teach your kids, but also we run free workshops all the time. So if the parents want to come and join one of our free online workshops, they can book through our website um, and then they can transfer those lessons to the kids or watch with the kids. Amazing. And then Catherine, something else I wanted to ask you about is um, I've heard this term going around called this, uh, the sandwich generation where basically people are living so much longer. So people in like their, you know, normally you, you retire, you use your money and you mm -hmm. sort of move on. But now people are living so much longer that they don't have enough retirement money to sort of last. And then the younger generation finds themselves in the sandwich where they have to now look after their children that are dependent on them, but also their parents that sort of become dependent on them um, financially, physically, everything, because, you know, people are living so much longer. So now the pressure is kind of coming from the older generation as well as the younger generation, um, which mm. obviously adds a whole lot of strain and, and pressure, especially in terms of savings, um, you know, trying to, trying to find the money to now save. So we, we don't have a saving culture in this country. We're a buy now, pay later society. Um, the credits, the people that supply us with credit and debt in this country have made sure of it. Um, but when it comes to saving, you know, the whole rule of you should be saving a minimum of 20% of your salary from the day you start working is true. So, you know, I, 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 I probably, if I had to look at my, my retirement savings to retire at 52, I definitely don't have enough right now, but I have a plan. 
Okay, so, and my plan is my business. Money savvy is my retirement plan. That's why I've built all these passive income streams and I'm rolling out into other countries. I plan on selling this business for 100 million Rand in eight years' time. That's my goal. So, you know, if you don't have enough money saved or you are starting to rely on your children, there's nothing stopping you from um, starting to create a second income stream for yourself and saving more. There's nothing stopping you from getting onto platforms like Easy Equities and um, trying your hand at investing. You know, um, it's so simple these days for you to actually look at ways of beefing up your income. But it's all around education, you know. If you're prepared to spend the time educating yourself and making some changes because theory doesn't work, you have to put stuff into practice, you're going to be able to change your financial situation quite quickly. When I was 30 years old, I was totally bankrupt. I was pregnant with my third child. My two older kids had been kicked out of school. My husband hadn't been paid for three months and we were totally bankrupt. And we sat in our financial advisor's office and he said, you guys have no savings, you have no investments. All you each have is an RA. He had to give us petrol money to get home that day. We were, we were like literally at the bottom of the barrel. I didn't even know how we were going to get ourselves out of that situation. But four years later, we were making between four and six million rand a year. And that was purely around financial education. So setting goals, starting to budget understanding what it was that was important to us, what we valued, um, making, we had different income streams. We both had jobs, plus we had a DVD store, plus we started a business on the side. We actually started two businesses on the side. You know, we made the, the required changes to change our life in, in a very short space of time. And if someone like me, who's a high school dropout, I dropped out of school in grade nine, if I can do it, anybody can do it. Because I don't have it's a being committed. I think it's being absolutely 100% committed. And, you know, that's, that's to me the, the absolute most important thing. And to, you know, I, I just want to get back to something that you, you talk about um, the, the different programs that you've got, Catherine. Do you do podcasts? I mean, can people listen to your advice and, and that sort of thing on podcasts? Are you on Spotify? We did, we did do a podcast series. Um, it didn't get a lot of uh, traffic. So we just kind of like left it uh, for now. Uh, but we did have, we do have some podcasts. So we've just, last year I went through a rebrand and we've had to build kind of all of our digital intelligence again, which is now all sitting on one server. So now that I have an internal team to manage those processes, that stuff will get done again. Um, but yeah, the podcasts are unfortunately not that high on our to-do list at the moment. Oh, okay. Because I, I, you know, that's something that I find so many friends of mine have been doing lately is just getting into the podcast and getting advice from, from them. And they, they're awesome. What about property, um, investing in property? We haven't touched on that. Is that something that you, you recommend? So I don't give financial advice. I'm a financial educator, so I never recommend anything. Uh, what I can say about property is um, there are definitely opportunities within property. It's definitely a buyer's market at the moment. Uh, people are selling properties for a lot cheaper than they normally would because they're in financial trouble and don't want to lose their houses. Um, but that also comes with a bunch of education. You know, if you're going to start buying properties and flipping them and, you know, you're going to have to have cash in the bank, you're going to need to do some training. Um, so what, when I do training with people that are kind of like moving towards the end of their life and starting to look at retirement and they're looking at what to do with their lump sum of money. I always say, like, if you don't have a property, it would be a good idea to buy a piece of land. Maybe you can build four or five small houses on it and rent them out and then create a rental income. But that also comes with its own set of problems. So, you know, I'm not going to say, yes, property is a good investment or no, it's not a good investment. It's do you have the required skills to, to make this a good investment? Do you have the commitment and the grit to make it work if you've never done this before? Uh, because not all properties are going to be profitable. Um, and then look at what happened in Durban, you know, the infrastructure, people's houses just washed away. So um, if you were one of those people, then no, property wasn't a good investment for you. Um, so it really comes down to uh, really understanding, one, how much money do you need to retire and what are your options? because not everybody has the option to buy property because either they have a bad credit record or they are entrepreneurs. So as an entrepreneur, you know how difficult it is to get credit for properties. If you don't put down a 30% deposit, you probably can't buy one because we're high risk, even though we make more money than employees. 
Um, so I, I would say understanding, firstly, what is your risk profile? So um, are you prepared to take risks? Are you not prepared to take risks? Are you conservative? Are you medium? Are you a high risk individual? Um, if you are a high risk individual and you've never done property before, investing in property is going to be a high risk. If you're a risky individual, then yes, go ahead with it. Um, but really understanding what is your risk profile, what opportunities can you create for yourself and how much money do you need? And then go and get some advice from a financial advisor and say, this is where I want to be. This is what I've got. What do you suggest? And let them help you with a plan because financial advisors are geared to help you build the life of your dreams in advance, not wait till you get there. They like help you plan to get there. So if you're looking for investment advice, I would definitely speak to a financial planner. Awesome. Catherine, you mentioned 20% should go to <clears throat> savings. Um, is there like a, a simple money recipe that people can follow? So you bring 100% in, 20% go goes to savings. Should a certain percentage go to investments? Um, I know it's, it's probably a very general question, but if there was a general answer. <laughs> uh, I, don't, I don't think there is a general answer because everybody's so different, you know. Um, so most people I know say 50% of their salary. Um, like I have friends that have retired already and they're in their 40s because they say 50% of their salary from the time they started working as teenagers and never had kids they put themselves in a situation to do that. So I don't think there's really any formula. It's really around what kind of retirement or what kind of life do you want for yourself? If you want to go and live on a, a small little a hut on the top of a mountain and grow your own food and have your own chickens and goats and live off the grid, well, then you don't need a lot of money. But if your dream is to travel the world, um, then you're going to need a lot more money. So really just understanding what is it that you want and planning, making a plan to get there. Awesome. Thank you. I read a statistic the other day that uh, for, I think it was 74% of people, their number one stressor is finances. So, um, yeah. Most people don't have 20% to put away because they have so much debt. So if you look at the average life of a middle-class person in South Africa, their house is bonded, their car's bonded, they've probably got store cards, they've probably got credit cards, they probably have high expenses, they're probably running out of money um, in the middle of the month, okay? So they don't, they can't afford to save 20%. And if one of the people in the household lost their job in the last two years, they probably have managed to, to incur even more debt. So saving is just not an option. So for me, um, if you wanted to start saving more money, the first thing you need to do is cut back on as much of your debt as possible. Pay off your debt, the money that you are allocating towards your debt, once it's paid off, start allocating that straight into a savings account. Um, make a list of all the debt, see what you can pay off quickly, uh, which one has the highest interest, get that cut back, and then take that money that you are allocating towards debt and put it in towards your savings. 100 percent, and also get yourself a good tax advisor because that yes. can save you a lot i mean i think we we pay way too much tax and yes, unless you've you got do. somebody looking after yes. your tax then. absolutely yeah and um, i wanted to know so like do you have another easier formula to help teach children the value of money like especially small kids like is there a phrase that you can start with and just um to kind of introduce <coughs> like you know saving their money or uh, wasting their money is there something you do that you know initiates this so firstly we want to make sure that we are creating a positive money mindset for our children so because we have a live in a, in, a, in a continent where there's so much poverty and corruption we're not sending the right money messages to people we're still saying things like money doesn't grow on trees so what you need to be the conversation you need to be having with your kids is Money is a resource that is helpful to you. And the more money you have, the more you can help or do things with. So just empower them to know that money is not hard to come by, that they can make money any way that they want. And if they just applied themselves um, and have conversations about money, talk to your kids about money. Like when, when, when they say, can I have this? And you go, no, I can't afford it. Tell them why you can't afford it and say to them, actually, I would love to buy you this toy, but um, I had a flat tire and I needed to get a spare. So we spent an extra 5,000 Rand this month and I had to take it out my savings. So I can't afford to buy you a toy. But if you mow the lawn for the next month, every Saturday, um, I will pay you 50 Rand and you can buy yourself that toy. You know, so 
empower them rather than um, just like saying no. Yeah, I hundred percent agree. Amazing. I mean, getting them to do chores is just such a. I think the money doesn't grow on trees thing came about because you know it's watching kids destroy something that a lot of money was spent on, and that's that's probably where that came about. And I still, I still believe that you, you know, children need to know the, the you know if they're the going to spend money. On yeah, you know, with with me, we've got four boys, and um, I actually was saying to my mom the other day, you know, I, I, right now in our life, we can't buy nice things because sadly they are little boys and they do play and they are rough and they do destroy things, and so until they are older and can respect things, yeah. they're not going to be spending money. Yeah. And you, you change in clothes every three months. I've got three sons. So I know just how expensive it is to raise so many boys. Um, and you can't. You can't invest money in nice furniture. And like I bought all their clothes from Pep and Ackermans and their toys because everything got broken. Boys are always break stuff. Yes, exactly. And then you go and buy the expensive thing and it doesn't last anyway half the time. Mm. I love the yeah. idea of sort of like cultivating this positive relationship with money almost. And, yes. and the will and want to to work hard for your money. You know, it, it um it doesn't always come easy, but to want to work hard and to have that that good and positive relationship with it because you know what it can eventually get you. Um, because I think a lot of people can't say that they have a, a positive or good relationship with, with money. With money. <clears throat> Ask any child what they want to be when they grow up, and you'll hear things like, I want to be a doctor, I want to save the world, or I want to save the whales but we're not teaching people how to build the life of their dreams. We teach them how to live the life of their means, you know, get a qualification, go get a job. Hopefully you get a good job, marry a, a wealthy guy, you know, uh, make sure you get taken care of. All of those messages are, are, are sent to, to, to girls and to children in general. Um, and we need to stop that. We do need to create that money mindset from, from, so between the ages of four and 12 is when the neural pathways are developing in children. And that's when you can really institute a mindset. If you think about yourself in primary school. So for me, we were told we didn't waste water and we don't litter. Those are two principles that I took with me. If you start teaching children to pay themselves first and save 50% of everything that they earn from the age of four years old, by the time they start earning money, they're going to be natural savers. Mm, it's true yeah I think so and you know, I think um we've ha we've covered just about all the bases Catherine thank you so much for for being on board with us Jess if you got is there anything you'd like to um wrap up with oh it's been so lovely thank you Catherine I know I've certainly um learned a lot uh, learned a lot and I know I can be a whole lot more hands-on when it comes to to finances um, I think sometimes it's scary to even go down that that avenue, but um, certainly need to. It's really, really important. Um, and yeah, as we said, awareness is obviously the catalyst to change. So if we want to start saving and we want to start living better lives, then we need to actually know where we are now and uh, where we can sort of make those changes. So I've definitely learned a lot and it's been so amazing to have you here. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. I have to agree. Stace, and you? Yeah, same, Catherine. Thank you so much for joining us. And I just love the, that you have showed us the value of just thinking about money, but also that we can all earn it. We can use what we've got. We can use our own skills and that we can know that money can come to us, that we can create it. So thank you. Thank you for educating yeah. us in that direction as well. Awesome. And I just Thanks like to so say, I think, I think we need to... Um, start walking um, or riding bicycles again, guys. And maybe even the horse yes, can be definitely. Um, <laughs> And earlier, okay. yeah, earlier you mentioned uh, courses on Udemy. That's actually an area that we uh, have just launched into Connectable Lab. We also um, now uh, have a whole course section for people to buy coaching and counseling courses and whatever. We're going to be developing that. We're going to turn it into all sorts of new directions. Awesome. So watch this space with Connectable Lab. Fantastic stuff. <laughs> yeah, it went live yeah. last week, so uh, you can go and check it out. <laughs> and it will obviously yeah, be and a, a growing space. Okay. If that's something you would also like to put on, Catherine, we would love to have your courses 
I know cool. that well, you have thanks. a whole lot of free material, but whatever you've got, we would love to put it on. I, I am going to get in touch with you ladies about getting onto the platform. I know Candace got herself on and I've been slack on my side, um, but I'll be in touch with you about that so we can have a, a separate discussion around that. I just wanted to ask, does anybody who's watching or listening uh, have any questions or any feedback? We still have like eight minutes left. Does anybody have a question that they want to ask? Um, I think let's put your your details in the chat box as well, Catherine. So, um, and I know Shane will send the, send the chat to everyone who's been listening. And then Jason says, who have we got coming on next Monday? So we we on again uh, the first week of August because now we move oh, that's into right. yeah, the, the once been, monthly. Yeah. Um, and we've got Candice King who is an EQ coach. Um, and she's going to be speaking about how to build better relationships. Oh, brilliant. Okay, super. Well, it's been an amazing day. Catherine, thank you so much for coming on board. You've been thank absolutely you. brilliant. We have learned such a lot. Yeah. And it's such awesome. a good time, Monday, first thing Monday morning, to learn more about money yes. and how we can save it. Yeah. Awesome. Exactly. And that it doesn't thank have to be so much. as well. I think that's the biggest thing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, Wonderful. Catherine. And thanks, thanks so much. Thanks so much, guys. Thank so much, guys. Have a good day. Bye. Have a great, Have a great week. Glenda, did you Bye. want to stay on the line? Yes, sure. Thanks, yes. everyone. Thanks, everyone.